I'm staring up into my brother Roger's eyes. He smiles down at me. It's really disturbing. Roger doesn't smile. Well, okay, that's not true. He smiles when he does things like tie me to a chair up in my room after our parents paid him to babysit me for the night, and he'd rather use the money to order pizza than invite his friends Skeeter and Dustin over to watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. So when I realize he's smiling at me, I kind of want to squeeze my head down into my neck and disappear like a turtle. Then Roger's face melts, leaving just a skull. That seems much more Roger-ish. Lily. His voice sounds deeper. Roger, you're a skull. It is I, Duma, says Skullface. Oh, great. Do you remember me? Yes. The desire to suck my head into my torso increases. Instead, I look around since I'm not a turtle girl. Everything's black. There's no furniture or lights or other people. I realize I'm not in pain anymore either. There had been this awful, burning, throbbing ache in my chest ever since that nut bar Tony stabbed me. But it seems to be gone now. Lily. Duma says in his low, toneless voice. It is good to see you again. In my head, I hear a single lonely cricket. Duma clears his throat after waiting for too long for a response from me. Anyway, if you could lend me your ear for a moment, child. There are forces at work currently that you need to be made aware of. I sigh to myself and lose a battle to not roll my eyes as I look back at him. His skull is kind of a dirty yellowish now that I'm giving it my attention. If I were painting him, I wouldn't use white at all. His color is more like a banana that's past its prime. Banana Skull Duma. Do you know what divergence means? He asks. Can you just assume that I don't and use a different word? Think of a path through the woods. Oh, for Pete's sake. That was made by someone who came before you. Everyone who sets foot in the forest follows the path. Well, not everyone. Because that's where the divergence comes in. When someone steps off the path, they are diverging from their course. When their steps meet the marked path again, that is called a convergence. Divergence, convergence. You see? I squeeze my eyes shut and pinch the bridge of my nose to try to keep my brain from leaking out into my lap. In our case, the forest isn't a literal forest. It is chaos. Do you know what chaos means? Am I in hell? I ask. Is that what this is? Hell is just a mental construct. I can't tell if that's a no or hell is messing with me. I feel a hand on my wrist. It's cold and bony, and I imagine if I open my eyes, I'll see that Duma's hands are skeletal, just like his face. Put your hand down and listen so we can get through this. He says. I put my hand down. Thank you. He continues. So as I was saying, chaos is like an immeasurable forest of trees. And then long ago, before you were born, before I was even made, a path was carved through the forest. That path is known as the word, and what it represents is certainty. Everything that came before and everything that comes after is certain because we follow the word. We follow the path. This is how Pasher and others like him know everything that is to come because he can look down the path and see it before we do. I hate to admit it, but I think I understand what he's saying. But it leaves me with a question. I raise my hand like you're supposed to when an adult is talking. What is that? What are you doing? Duma sounds confused. Has nobody ever raised their hand in front of him before? I have a question. Okay. I hesitate because I don't know if his okay means I can ask or if he just understands why I'm raising my hand now. So, so if we're following the path, the word... What exactly is the point of my ability to see things before they happen? Even if I say or do anything, we stay on the path, don't we? There's this weird creaking sound and I quickly realize it's Duma's bony face curving up into a smile. Oh good gravy, please stop smiling. I'm going to have nightmares for the rest of my life now. Excellent question. He says. That's why I was telling you about divergences. You see, there's this concept called entropy 
And can I just wake up and let Tony finish me off, please? What it means, basically, is that the path is not a thin, straight line, but is actually a multitude of lines that all lead in the same general direction. You can set foot off the path a step left, maybe a step right, but as long as you don't step too far off the path, you reach the same destination just with slightly different variations of events. What happens if you step too far off the path? I told you. Chaos. I don't know, chaos doesn't sound that bad. It sounds like I can make a big change in the course of my life or the lives of others. Like, what if I hadn't told Roger he was going to die and then we didn't get in that accident and he didn't die? It seems to me that Roger still being alive would have made a pretty big change in a lot of ways. Maybe my parents would still be alive too. In a way, Roger dying led to my parents dying. I wish I could go back and change that, but Samuel offered me that chance and I didn't take it. Was he trying to lead me down the path of chaos? Oh shit, Doom is still talking, but I haven't been listening. And that's where you come in. He looks at me blankly, which isn't saying much because his face is a skull and blank by nature. His mouth creaks back down out of the smile it had been in. He probably sees the look of panic on my face. Try to look less panicked, Lily. Oh crud, that's just me panicking more. Were you listening to anything I just said? That's where I come in. Hm. I learned this trick from history class. Just repeat the last thing you heard and you're good. Yes. So over the millennia, there have been only a scarce number of significant divergences. That's not to say that the word is flawed in any way. Never think that. But there have been times where it was decided that a significant step off the path, just for one or a select few individuals, was acceptable as long as we ensured that they were guided back into step and not allowed to deviate into utter chaos. I really wish he'd stop using all these big words. The only reason I even know what deviate means is because my uncle George had a deviated septum, and I learned that deviate means to snore really loudly. Duma looks down at me. Any questions? Yeah, I clear my throat. I thought you were supposed to be the angel of silence. We have a short staring contest. I lose because Duma doesn't even have eyelids. Or eyes. I think that's kind of cheating. He gives a heavy sigh, then clenches his jawbone. I can see his teeth grinding against each other slowly, back and forth. Teeth grinding is another thing my Uncle George did. They called it nocturnal brooksism? I think they just want to make grinding your teeth sound cool. Baradiel! Duma suddenly shouts, startling me back from my thoughts of my Uncle George snoring and grinding his teeth. Yes? Comes a voice from out of nowhere. From the projector. Duma says coldly. Let's just be done with this. I can see her eyes glazing over. Suddenly, a screen lights up in front of us. It looks a lot like the film screen from the movie theater I sat in with Roger and then later Raziel. I look around, but there's no actual theater. No seats, no aisle, no popcorn on the floor, no floor. What happened to the movie theater? I asked. The screen flickers yellow-white with burnt edges like an old piece of paper. I hear a hiss pop from behind me, followed by the sound of a film reel flapping. Someone mutters words of annoyance, and the screen turns back off, leaving us in the dark again. We're in the process of dismantling this false actuality. Can't have any more dreamers accidentally stumbling into your little dark fantasy world. Any more? Duma clears his throat nervously. It's not comforting when the angel of death clears his throat nervously. There was a young man from Brussels who found himself here after... experimenting with hallucinogens. It's not unheard of. In any case, this wanderer happened into a large, warped section of the library you created and was viciously mauled by some sort of enormous undulate. When I get out of all of this, I'm really going to dedicate myself to improving my vocabulary because I understand almost none of what he just said. Someone was experimenting with halogen light bulbs and somehow got trapped in the town library where something big drove him to the mall? I'm pretty sure that's not what he meant, but it's what I heard. We don't even have a mall around here. The film starts back up with a whir and we're seeing a familiar place. My old home. It's clearly a long time ago because we're floating over the living room and there's this old checkered couch. It's gray tone, but everything is gray tone. The couch was green. 
My parents got rid of it after toddler me threw up while watching The Little Mermaid with a babysitter, and she didn't notice because the sick went down the back of the cushions while she was getting another big bowl of popcorn made. Roger was with my parents at the time because it was open house for his elementary school. The sick soaked into the upholster of my couch until nobody could stand pretending they didn't notice the smell any longer, and my parents finally investigated and found my month-old toddler puke. I only know the story because my parents loved to tell it every time we had guests over who commented on how nice our new couch was. This may feel a bit disorienting, Duma's voice says. I can no longer see him. I've been through this before. I try to shrug, but I've become just a floating, disembodied pair of eyes watching things unfold. I hate this feeling. Below me, a door opens somewhere and then closes. I only hear it. My mother's voice. She's talking to someone. We drift downward until we're standing, or sitting, beside the couch. Roger walks into the room holding Pasher, and he flops down face first onto the couch. I don't think we're at the point where toddler me puked in it yet, so it should probably smell alright to him. Roger, Pasher says in his always calm voice. I feel a little pang of sadness in my heart. It actually really hurts, like a sharp needling sticking me inside. Ugh. Roger responds. He rolls over and sits Pasher on his chest. Am I crazy, Joe? Or are you real? Like, really real? Actually, don't answer that. If you're real, you'll say you're real. But if you're not real, you'll still say you're real. Why can't I just be normal? You are normal, Pasher says. Have I ever told you how strong you are? Roger sits up and holds Pasher out in front of him. From my perspective, Pasher's plastic face is looking directly at me, just inches away. I want to reach out and take him, but I have no hands, no fingers to grip with, nothing. My own mom is afraid of me, Roger says in a voice that cracks with emotion. She thinks I'm a freak. I'm so tired of seeing it in her eyes. I don't want her to be afraid of me anymore. I don't want my dad to be embarrassed of me. Please. I don't want this. Roger, you don't have to act upon the word. Your gift is simply to know it. What you do with that is up to you. If you choose to be normal, as you say, then be normal. You are under your own control. Do you understand what that means? Not a single other person on Earth has that autonomy. They are all rigidly bound to the word. Only you have the power to stray from it. Roger gives a heavy sigh. I don't want it. The screen goes all white. I have to close my eyes because it's so bright it makes my head hurt. I peek one open and the screen is still all white. Nothing is going on. Bear with us. Duma says, patting my shoulder as he stands up. We can't show you this next part because it involves a plane of existence you will never comprehend. However, it was suggested that we could try to recreate the important part with a puppet show. Are you kidding me? Maybe I'm just having a really crazy dream. That's gotta be it. I'm not about to watch a puppet show put on by the Angel of Death. I just ate a spoiled piece of pizza and I'm having an insane nightmare. Something brushes past me, bumping into my elbow. Thank you, Baratiel, says Duma. I glance up. He's holding a bunch of little stitched cloth finger puppets in his bony hands. I look over my shoulder, but there's nobody there. Duma fiddles with the little puppets, putting them on his fingers. There's an angel with golden wings and marble white skin wearing a little white dress and a halo on its head. It looks like a Christmas tree ornament. Another is a little rubber skeleton with jiggly arms and a working jaw. And then there's another one that's brownish and looks like Bullwinkle with googly eyes. So this is the meeting between Pasher, Metatron, and myself. Duma explains. I have to ask. Is Metatron a moose? Duma looks at the little Bullwinkle on his finger. It turns and looks up at him with its googly eyes. There is nothing in your world that would come close to representing Metatron, so we went with what we had. Jiminy Crickets. Why not use a robot that can turn into a gun? Because that's not a finger puppet. He clears his throat even though he technically doesn't have one. May I please proceed? This is... humbling. I shrug and fall back into my seat. 
Let's go on with it, I guess. Duma holds up his hands with the puppets on them. On the right is his rubber skeleton and Metatron's moose. On the left is Pasher's angel ornament. And so Pasher came before Metatron. As his ritual, one other was chosen to bear witness. That was me. He wiggles his rubber skeleton finger puppet. Roger Madwhip does not want to be a totem bearer any longer, says the Pasher puppet in Pasher's voice. I sit up, but my jaw falls down into my lap. Pasher? Are you in the puppet? Shh! Duma hisses. I'm doing all the voices. Now be silent or I'll have to make you. He could do it, too. I'll say this, though. Duma is good at impersonating other angels. He wouldn't be the first, says Metatron. His voice echoes in the emptiness of the no longer a theater. And he won't be the last. What makes this worth my time? The gift will break him, Pasher says. I see it. It eats at him every day, and all I can do is try to comfort him and watch his light dwindle. If we do nothing now, before he reaches maturity, we will have no choice but to cast him into the oubliette to prevent another catastrophe. Neither you nor I can see that, and you know it. Metatron snorts. We've passed on the totem to another before, says Duma. Or rather, says Duma's puppet of himself. Metatron turns to Duma. I see now why you chose Duma as your witness. No one else would stand with you on this matter, would they? Because we all remember the death toll from the last time we allowed ourselves to stray from the word in this manner. Duma stiffens. Real Duma. I mean, not his little rubber puppet. I wonder why he seems so suddenly offended by the words he's reciting as if he didn't hear them before. I am here because I believe in my brother, says little Duma. If Pasher believes this must be done, then so do I. We cannot go against the word, Metatron says sternly. Pasher's angel ornament nods. But what if we were to reinterpret it? The moose and skeleton look at each other and then back at the angel. What do you mean? asks the moose. Moosatron. I'm calling him that from now on. I have looked at the word. The word says that the child of John and Catherine Madwhip is the knife that cuts the veil. The word says the child, not Roger. It's not very specific. Why is that? All things are intentional with the word. Real Duma looks up at me. His hollow eyes want to suck me in. I look back at the puppets because they are less likely to show up again in my nightmares. Although I'm still not sure if this is one or not. You speak of the other child. Musatron leans its head back and its little felt hoof reaches up to stroke its chin. Okay, I snap. I get it. You guys decided to make me have the totem instead of Roger. Duma lowers his hands with the puppets on them. Yes, but... Yeah, I kind of figured this out way back with the whole movie. The puppet show was seriously unnecessary. You don't understand. Uh, hello? Roger had the doll. Now I have the doll. You forced it on me and screwed up my life instead of Roger's. What's not to get? Nobody forced the totem on you, Lillian. You were offered it, and you took it. I bang my fists on the chair arms in anger. I want to punch Duma in his stupid, skinless face. I was a baby. You could have handed me a mummified cat turd, and I'd probably have taken it. I pause and consider what I just said. Probably. Pasher believed in you. When he suggested that the totem be offered to you, personally, I was aghast. I had thought we would be giving it to someone... stronger. Thanks. I mutter. I was right, of course. You are too weak to bear this responsibility, just like your brother. Honestly, I don't know why Pasher insists on working with children. Hey, screw you, Skeletor! I yell, jumping to my feet and jabbing my finger at him. I'm not weak. I'm stronger than Wonder Woman. Did I just curl up and cry after you all blew up my parents? No! Well, actually, yes. But only at first. And then I got right back on the horse and started taking things into my own hands. Duma brushes my hand away. By taking things into your own hands, do you mean having this giant tantrum? Summoning demons, wrecking havoc thing you're doing? I shove him with both of my hands. He doesn't move, of course. I just end up sliding backwards instead. He doesn't say anything, but if he had skin on his face, I bet anything he'd be smirking at me. I hate Duma! Ah yes, physical confrontation. The last act of someone with no argument left. Who are you to judge me? I say through gritted teeth. That's Joe Fayol's job. Maybe you think you know better than him? 
I stood in his fire and I came out clean. Could you do the same? I don't even know where these words are coming from. Duma shifts ever so slightly, just the slightest step back. It feels good to notice. If you're so strong, why are you here? He asks. It doesn't sound like a challenge. It sounds like a sincere question. What do you mean? Who am I? That's a weird question. You're Duma. No. Says Duma. That is my name. Who am I? Who am I? I'm less sure this time. The Angel of Death? We could have had anyone sit here and put on this sad puppet show for you, but I performed it despite everything because I had to be here anyway. Do you understand? I had to be here. My body goes numb. I can't feel my legs. I actually look down to be sure they're still there. Yep, still there. While I'm looking, I notice that my pajamas are all sticky looking. There's a big black wet mark on my tummy area. The edges of it are red. What's going on? I can barely hear my own voice. I'm whispering because I don't really want to know the answer. What's happened? You've died. The words echo in my ears louder than Musatron's voice in the puppet show. They're not there in my ears. If anything, the whole place has gone absolutely silent. More silent than Duma's silence ability. I'm exaggerating, of course, because silence can only be so silent. It can't be more silent, but the point is that there's nothing. Absolutely nothing. Not even my breathing. And yet I hear the words, You've died. Inside my head. I'm not dead, I say. You're literally staring the angel of death in the face, little one. His voice sounds cold and empty. He really was the best choice for Pasher's witness. He's so utterly uncaring. Isn't this what you wanted? You'll get to see your parents now. My parents? My heart leaps in my chest. Do I still have a heart, though? Or is it back in my body? No, don't think such things, Lily. He nods his bony head. They're waiting for you in the Locus Ammonius. It's a small construct designed by Samuel a long, long time ago. Don't worry about it being of his design. It's a peaceful place. What about Pasher? I feel a lump in my throat. I was just beginning to miss him. Duma looks away for a moment. He tugs at his robe with the finger that has Pasher's angel ornament on it. We're... Actually, in the process of reuniting him with his original owner. The other knife that cuts the veil. What? Does that mean... I suddenly have a vivid memory of looking up at the night sky and Roger's face filling my vision. That was just moments ago, before I found myself here in the dark with dumbass Duma. Roger was there, in the living world, watching me die. Duma pops the other finger puppets off his hand and tucks them away in the darkness of his robes. Then he drums his fingers on the armrest. He tilts his skull at me ever so slightly, expectantly. Roger was sent out under the pretext of cleaning up your mess with that demon you let possess you. Afterward, he gets to go back to being the totem bearer as was originally planned. Things were just too unstable with you at the wheel, wouldn't you say? He exercises that little pest... You come with me to be with your parents. Everybody's happy. So, all loose ends tied up, yes? But... I don't really want to be dead. I swallow the lump. I want my parents to be alive again. I want to grow up with them. And Roger. Duma sighs. You are trying my patience. I'm not going with you. The room goes dark. No, the light from the projector just turned off, but at the same time, Duma has gotten taller, more menacing. He seems to loom over me. He speaks. His voice is dark and terrible and frightening. You are coming with me, Lily Madwick. No! I scream at him. I have stuff to do! Whoa! His voice sounds different, younger, more surprised. No, wait, that's not his voice, it's 
Roger's voice. I'm lying on the ground, staring up at the night sky again, and Roger's looking down at me with a shocked expression. I thought we lost you for a moment there, he says. His eyes are dripping with tears and he smiles down at me. It's really unnerving because, as I said, Roger almost never smiles. Maybe they messed with his brain or something? Please stop smiling at me, Roger. It's weirding me out. Why is my face all wet? I managed to choke out. My tummy burns and I still can't feel my legs. Have you been crying on me? Somewhere close by, someone else grunts and yells something nonsensical. I don't recognize their voice. Sounds like there's a fight going on. Like a pair of angry dogs wrestling each other. Roger lifts my head and hugs me to his chest. He rocks me gently. I am thoroughly confused. I almost wonder for a moment if I'm dreaming for real this time, except I'm in too much pain and I wasn't before when I was with Duma, so this has got to be the real world because everybody knows the world is painful. My lily bird, Roger says softly, petting my head. Oh, my lily bird! I cough up some blood and try to wipe my mouth with my sleeve, but I can't lift my arm. What the F is going on? For those of you guys that like getting cozy while listening to stories, I'm going to let you know about Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea. That's my wife's tea shop. She sells hand blended teas. There's creepy pasta based teas if you want to get one that's a flavor that you like, or there's Mr. Creepy Pasta Tea, which happens to be a tea that I drink fairly often. Some other ones I really suggest, the Gashel Greens, which is also one that I drink, and the Hibiscus, which has helped me out a lot with my high blood pressure. Uh, if you guys also like the, if you want to see like the Hibiscus Tea, I think it's also called the Jeff the Killer Tea. So, goddamn, Jeff is constantly in my life and there's no escaping him. Once again, that's Etsy.com slash shop slash Ivory Monocle Tea. A big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Jacob Fenske, Stephanie Butler, Jordan Humble, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Brimstone Pandemonium, Kyle Tuna, William Wellington, Emma, Brenna Crow, Lakeda Canizales, Smiley the Psychotic, Dante Kincaid, Simba's Bloody Mojo, Mephistopheles, Curse Pox Primark, Bastion Beefcake, M, Jesus Corneo, Yargul, Clownable, Amber Clark, Jay Kearns, Dakota Lane Whetstone, Himbo Jerry, Crusader Chocobo, Adam Marius, Estebean, Nick Cole, Our Minsect Time, Xylobones, Angelus, Seclude, Salty Surprise, Love it a Galvin, That Creepy Chick, Red Shadow Cat, Turtle Man, Carolinian, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Ika Limchok, Dirty Diver 030, Matt Bach, Voice of Sand, Ika Mount, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, William King, Darth Miver, Sashi Sasaku, Broken Up 509, Stricket, Ready Kruger, Lisa Cottrell, Hades Nephew, Acid System, Mog, Kiri the Sloth, Bester's Lampshade, Nico Kyle, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. To all of you guys, I cannot thank you enough. Thank you for being a huge support to me. Thank you to everybody who's in the description down below, and thank you to everyone who can even support $1 just on Patreon to help keep the content coming.